Okay, everyone. Good morning again. Um, it's 8.54. We have like around five and a half minutes and then we'll start the meeting. But thanks so much. Um, yeah, we'll just do a little more philosophy of mind in a few moments here. <clears throat> Hey, Stephen, good morning. <clears throat> I know I sent your uh, comments off for your draft, so hopefully you were able to read through those. <clears throat> Thank you for that, too. I think you had that funny example about the moon being gray or whatever. Yeah, I remember that. <clears throat> oh yeah, not to worry, yeah. If you have a second draft later and you would like more comments, you can always let me know. <clears throat> Morning, Sloan. Good to see you. <clears throat> Ryan, welcome. Good morning. Hey, Kylie, Eloise, how's it going there? Good to see you. <clears throat> Hello, Hi. good morning. <clears throat> it's Cliff. Yes. Yeah. Uh, welcome back. It's kind of when there's only a few students that come, it's like you, you definitely remember the names. Yeah, right. <clears throat> I'm glad I kind of set a trend by coming in person. Yeah, yeah. A few, a few others have showed up, and it's been kind of nice to see that. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> Morning, Nina. Welcome back to class. <clears throat> Classes Sometimes I teach, uh, I've taught the ethics class here, logic, and also um, epistemology, which is called um, belief, truth, and knowledge, just like a whole, oh, okay. a whole semester just on that. But not every time do I get the different course offerings. Usually it's just intro, but sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll step in and pick up a different course for them. Um, so yeah, but once in a while. In the is fall, it's just only, more intro. Hmm? Is this your only in-person class? Um, no, I mean, the other one that I teach at 10 right next door is also in person right now. Oh, that's nice. I just, uh, I offered it to the students, and um, and some have had interest, so just a couple are showing up, but it's nice. Yeah. Um, so, Stephen, you really wanted that belief class, but it wasn't available. Yeah, I do not know when it's going to be offered. Uh, Steven, you're asking me that. Uh, usually it would be in the fall semester. I've taught it a couple times here in the fall, um, but it's not every academic year that they put it up on the schedule. Maybe it will happen again, not this fall, but the following, if you're still here at Chapman. So we'll just hope for that. <clears throat> I'm going to teach the same type of course at a different institution in the spring, but that's not really 
of use to you, I guess. Anyway, good to see you guys there. Nina, Amanda, Julia, and everybody else. Nice. So just a couple seconds here. <clears throat> And hi, Nicole. Welcome. Okay, so I'll just go ahead and uh, let our get let our meeting get started right now. Since we're close to ten or nine, rather. So good, guys. Welcome back. Um, I've been uh, managing the little drama of my uh, car issue the other day. Hey there. Um, but it's all now getting repaired, and they're fixing the window and sending me a check for the guitar and everything. So good news on that uh, front. But um, yes, we are now finishing up today our topic of the philosophy of mind. We just have this one last author to go through. And um, let me just first say a couple of words about the previous meeting and the author, J.J.C. Uh, Smart, and his article, Sensations and Brain Processes. Once I give you that little recap, then we can uh, press forward and deal with Alan Turing's material today. And then we will be right on track to start the next topic on Friday, the last topic, which is life and death. So um, <clears throat> philosophy of mind, consciousness, is it just physical? Is it not physical? What's up? Is it dualism that is true or is it physicalism? Now, Descartes argued for dualism on the basis that you can imagine your mind and body existing separately. And since that's clearly conceivable, he thinks God would not allow it to be otherwise since he believes God is infinitely good. He thinks he can prove that he exists. And since he's infinitely good, he wouldn't allow clear and distinct perceptions to be false, among which is the idea that if two things could be conceived of as existing separately, they really are. Then you had um, Daniel Stoljar, who just says, first of all, oh, hi there, Grant and Ryan and everybody. Um, yeah, so Daniel Stoljar says, physicalism is the claim that everything is physical. The way to best un understand that or interpret the statement that everything is physical is to look to the concept of supervenience which is like when you have a big structure or a composite thing that's made out of a bunch of little elemental parts. And um, whether it's a dot matrix picture or a pixelated image that you show on a digitized screen, that's a concept that we can understand through those kind of models. He says the physical universe is similar because it's a big composite structure that's built out of a base of little atoms. And the point he makes is that if there were two physical universes that were identical in their atomic arrangement, then they would have to have all the same psychological, social, and historical features which would imply that your consciousness and thoughts and everything going on mentally is entirely governed and constituted by the physical structure of the atoms that make everything up. Okay, and then last time it was JJC Smart and um, sensations and brain processes. He's another physicalist. He starts by saying that his overall thesis is that sensations are just identical to brain processes. Now, sensation is a term that he uses broadly to express any kind of state of consciousness um, whatsoever. Um, and he says all of them all together are just brain conscious, sorry, brain states. So consciousness and whatever states of consciousness that we have that he calls sensations are just configurations of the physical brain at that given time. So that means that, you know, your mental stuff is all just physical because it's based on the physical brain. Um, he thinks that if the consciousness and thought was not, um, identical to brain processes, then it would be this mysterious nomological dangler, something that remains completely outside of scientific understanding. And uh, science does not like to concede that there are such things as those. So rather than think of consciousness as a nomological dangler, why not just assume that it is um, entirely identical to the brain and the physical states of the brain? Now, <clears throat> he, re he reports on a number of objections to this claim that sensations are brain processes, and he tries to refute each one of them. In one case, the objection is that um, I can talk about my sensations, no problem, but I really cannot tell you anything much about what's going on within my brain. So to some people, this seems as though it's a reason to deny that they're the same. Because if I could talk about one but not the other, like I can talk about experiences and sensations in everyday conversational talk, but I don't have any comprehension at all of the facts about what's happening in my brain. So how could the conscious states be identical to the brain process? He read he rejects this by saying that just because there are two words or labels or descriptions for something within language, that does not necessarily mean there have to be two different things referred to by the different descriptions. As an example he gives, he refers to the, uh, the case of the morning and the evening star. At one time in history, people believed these were two separate stars, one the brightest star in the evening sky, 
labeled the evening star. The other, the brightest star in the morning sky, labeled the morning star. It was eventually determined that these were actually the same object, despite the fact that there were two different uh, distinct labels and even descriptions of them in language. So in the same way, he says, when you talk about your brain processes or your sensations, you talk about them differently, but that does not necessarily mean that they are two different things, as again, given by the example of the morning and the evening star, or even lightning and electricity, another example he gives. And then the other objections and replies are in some cases similar to that. <clears throat> in another one, he says the words, like the critic, the objector would say that the words brain process and sensation have different meanings, so they must not be the same thing. And again, in a similar way, he says that just because words have different meanings, they can still have a common reference. Um, the question is also raised in an objection that aren't uh, brain processes things that can be observed by others, but your sensations and experiences cannot. Uh, in that case, he flatly denies that there's a difference, just saying that sensations are brain processes, and um, the language of talking about sensations versus brain processes differs, but again, that should not lead us to think that there's a physical difference between the two things mentioned by the words. And um, there was also the point that um, the brain processes are, let's see, we talked about a number of objections. I want to make sure I didn't forget all of them in my recap for you. Let me go back into my notes. Another one was Descartes' objection, which says that I can imagine my brain processes and uh, sensations being different. I can imagine myself having sensations even if I had no body or brain. So doesn't that imply that they're not the same. And he says in that case, well, I can also imagine that lightning and electricity are not the same or that the morning star and the evening star are not the same, but they are. So he kind of rejects the point that it's a kind of window into whether two things are different just because they can be conceived of as being two different things. Um, and sensations are private, brain processes are public. Oh, and there's also this thing about whether the brain process and the sensation are both located somewhere in space. You could argue that your sensations don't appear to have any obvious physical location, but a brain process clearly does, and yet that's another difference. But he says again, no, that's uh, language misleading us. In fact, the brain process and the sensation are identical, so the sensation has a location, and it's wherever the brain is. Okay, so looking back at all of that material, now we're ready to go forward with the last author on this uh, topic. So here is who the person is, Alan Turing, <clears throat> and uh, this paper is called Computing Machinery and Intelligence. So I flipped around in my notes, now i got to get back to that part of the notes, hold on. Oh yeah, okay, here we go. So here's the author, du jour, author of the day, Alan Turing. <clears throat> and he lived from 1912 until 1954. Uh, we're looking at a paper from 1950 that he wrote, which is called um, Computing Machinery and Intelligence. Computing Machinery and Intelligence by Mr. Alan Turing. Now, um, let me tell you a little bit of biographical information about Turing, because he's a pretty interesting figure. Um, this is uh, the man who is known as the kind of inventor or father of the digital computer. Okay, so how important is that invention as, as we're all using them all the time every day? Uh, web browsing, uh, social media, um, <clears throat> telecommunications, um, the World Wide Web and everything that has to do with computing aside from, you know, internet applications of computing technology. So, you know, guided missiles, satellite technology, communication between devices, whatever. Computing, it's like the modern world that we're living in. It's not the world of, uh, you know, agrarian farmers and stuff of the 1800s and prior to that, you know, an innovation of um, telecommunications, telephones, televisions, computers, and so on. But anyway, Turing is known as that uh, inventor of the digital computer, revolutionary device. So I feel like in a way he should be more of a household name than he even is, but there's been some attention given to him in recent um, uh, pop culture. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this film, but there was an Oscar winning performance by Benedict Cumberbatch when he depicted Alan Turing in the movie, The Imitation Game. So The Imitation Game is like a couple years old and he did win best actor for that. Uh, so that movie actually is just a biopic of Alan Turing's life. 
Aside from his work developing early computing languages and digital computers, he was also involved as a code breaker for the, um, the Allies when we fought against uh, the Axis powers and Nazi Germany in World War II. So he actually had a key role in, uh, uh, what is it, um, decoding encrypted messages that were being used by Nazis and other Axis powers that we were fighting in World War II. So he had a key role in actually uh, securing victory over, uh, you know, Nazism and fascism. So anyway, yeah, he had a huge impact, but he's not as well known as he perhaps ought to be. Uh, there's some controversies in his life that are uh, kind of sad, <clears throat> not necessarily having to do with any misconduct on his part, but he was a gay man, okay? And back then, especially, uh, there were even laws in Britain at the time that uh, a person that was recognized as, like, out with their, um, you know, gay orientation could be punished under law. And he was exposed by somebody and brought into trial, and they forced him to undergo like chemical castration where you will take a cocktail of drugs that are supposed to like destroy your sexual drives and libido and all of that. So um, <clears throat> he's kind of punished for this. And then he ended up dying at a young age, as you can see, just 42. He died from cyanide poisoning, which some people thought was foul play, but I think um, maybe officially ruled as suicide. But at any rate, uh, we're learning a little bit about his work uh, in terms of artificial intelligence and computing. This paper that he wrote in 1950, which was published in the philosophy journal Mind, um, it argues that at some future time, machines will achieve consciousness, like what we have, that we are exhibiting right now just by either listening or giving a lecture, uh, that machines, computers, whatever you want to call them, that man-made um, <clears throat> computing systems will someday achieve you know, consciousness, the ability to think and feel and perceive like we have. So that's his overall position, and he's going to try and make the argument that, you know, it's, it's possible anyway for computers to have consciousness. Not when he wrote this, of course, in 1950, when the state of computing was clearly in its infancy stages. Uh, you'd have a computer that would be like the size of a garage, and it would have less computing power than, you know, your pocket calculator or for sure your cell phone. But at any rate, you got to start somewhere, and he's a pioneer. So um, <clears throat> let me go ahead then and start walking you through the stuff that's in the paper. It's pretty interesting. So, um, and by the way, you know, in 1950, it's a pretty visionary uh, hypothesis to assert that computers, at the state of like sophistication they had then, would someday be conscious things. Today, in the year 2021, we're a little closer to the fulfillment of his. Uh, prediction because as you know there are supercomputers that you can entirely have conversations with that can write songs that can write screenplays uh, so there's a lot of science fictional films and stuff that also explore these themes about a day in the not so distant future when we're having relationships with computers or we're having you know um, home house assistants that are like uh, personable and have whatever appear to be personalities and stuff so the question is is this possible some people don't think so, right? Tur Turing's view that it is possible is not shared by everyone. Some people say that machines, computers, will never achieve consciousness because they're synthetic and man-made, that even if they exhibit behavior that appears to be conscious-like, it's not actually the real thing inside. There's nothing going on inside like, like what we have when we feel things and think about things. But we'll go over his paper now. So he starts off by posing a, a straightforward question. Can machines think? Is that possible for machines to have thought and consciousness. And um, he says, let me try and ask this question in a less ambiguous way with a more definite meaning. Because um, he says we shouldn't just refer to the common man or woman's understanding of what are these machines or what we call thinking. So he rephrases the question in terms of what he calls an imitation game. Now, <clears throat> the imitation game is actually like a party game that you would play with like a little social gathering, the first iteration or version of it. And he's going to try and change some basic features of this imitation game so that it becomes a test for whether machines could ever have consciousness. So what I'm going to try and do now is explain to you like the, um, the silly party game version of the imitation game that's not exactly directly relevant to his, his own um, application of it to the question of whether computers could think. But then once I've talked to you about that other version of it, we'll go over like the Turing test version of the imitation game. Okay, so... Here's how the imitation game would be played. Um, 
if it was done with just human subjects as like a silly game that you'd have at like a social event or a party, whatever. Um, <clears throat> so basically, here's how we play it. Let me write down the title, Imitation Game. Okay, so to play the game, you need to have a couple of elements. First of all, you have to have three people, um, and you have to have like a, a wall here. Okay, so there's three individuals. You have A and B and C. We're going to say that C is a person of either gender, and they're what we call the interrogator. That's their role. They're on this side of the wall. On the opposite side of the wall, you have two subjects. One is a man and one is a woman. So let's say that A is the male subject. B is a female subject. Trying to just make the hair a little different. I know, obviously, that the hairstyles can be of any kind, whether you're a man or a woman, but just to kind of give a little uh, cartoon image like you'd see on the bathroom. Okay, so C is the interrogator. A and B are the other two players. Now, here's how we play this game. Um, the goal of the interrogator is straightforward. The interrogator is in another room, and his goal is to try and ask questions of A and B. And based on the answers that he gets back from them, he has to try and determine who is the man and who is the woman. Okay, so it's like a gender guessing game. Which one am I talking to that is a man and which one that I'm talking to is a woman? Now, to make the game a little difficult for the interrogator, right, um, the player's on the other side of the partition, so B is a woman. And B will just answer questions, let's suppose, like a woman would naturally in her own way. But A is trying to throw off the interrogator. So A is trying to cause the interrogator to give the wrong identification, which means that when he is given questions, he's going to try and answer them in the way that he thinks what type of person would answer them. That's a question for you. So are you following me? What's the way that A would try to answer these questions to trick C into giving the wrong identification? He will try to pose answers as though... He's what? A woman. a woman, correct. So I don't want to like play on uh, gender stereotypes, obviously. And thank you, Ellie, correct. But like if they asked A, tell me, what is your favorite movie? Right. He's going to try to give what he thinks of as like a stereotypically feminine uh, answer. Right. So maybe he will say like a romantic comedy or, you know, something that caters to the um, stereotype sensibilities of like the feminine gender identity. Right. So anyway. That's the goal uh, that A has, to try and deceive C. And so what will be a win for C? He gets a window of time to interview both of the two subjects. And after he's conducted those two interviews, like, say, five minutes, any questions that he wants to both, you know, and his questions are probing them to try and, you know, determine who really is the man and who is the woman. He knows there's one of each, but he's not sure which one it is. All he knows is that he's interviewing A first, and then he's interviewing B. And then later he'll have to make his determination. So what's a win for C is clearly this, if he gets the right identification. So post-interview, if he says, okay, here's my call. B was the woman and A was the man, then he won. But what's a loss, obviously, is if he got a misidentification. So if A was able to confuse him with the answers given, and it's such that C says, I believe that A was the woman and B was the man, then C lost that round of the imitation game. Okay, so you can imagine this is like a, like a game that people can play at like a social a gathering where they're just trying to have fun. Um, let me ask a couple of other questions just to make sure that we're all clear. How do you think these questions will be submitted and how will the answers be uh, submitted? In what format to make sure that the game has a point? Like in what mechanism or way will questions be delivered and answers sent back? What do you think? How can we do this to make sure that the game, you know, is not too easy? You say slips of paper. Okay, good. I was going to just say, yeah, there you go, Stephen. Written. They have to be typed or written answers and questions. Why is that important? Let's be clear. Why? You say so. So why? Correct. You can't hear the voice, right? So if he heard the voice and he could hear like a deeper male voice and a you know higher pitch feminine voice, he would be able to say, I don't care what your questions, answers are. I can just tell by a tone of voice. So making sure he's behind a wall, obviously he can't see the people, and not allowing him to hear the voice makes the question content the whole basis for his, you know, selection. And so that makes it a game that is kind of tricky and, you know, there's a little bit of difficulty to it. Okay. So then, good. Now, what Turing, Alan Turing says is we're going to modify certain key aspects of this game 
so that it becomes a way of testing whether computers could have consciousness. Okay, so he calls it the imitation game. But if you guys ever want to like look stuff up about this, it's like a famous concept since he wrote this paper years back. Uh, it's often now referred to as the Turing test, like given his namesake. But of course, he's Turing, so he doesn't say, hey, guys, want to hear about the Turing test? He's talking about the imitation game, which has now been given his namesake. So anyways, a lot of, there's a wealth of examples of like contemporary players playing the Turing test and AI labs all around the world. There's actually a big competition every year called the Loebner Prize, where the best AI chatbots that are currently out there uh, try to pass the Turing test. And we're getting closer and closer every day. The best one right now, just so you know, is Mitsuku. She's been winning the prize like for a couple years consecutively. And you can go ahead and just talk to her, it, them, whatever. Um, Whenever you like, there's an app that you download, and uh, it's very weird. It's almost eerie. The quality of the answers gets more realistic every year because I teach this every year, and so Mitsuku keeps evolving. I'll play the Turing test when we have like full class in person meetings, where I'm having an interview with the robot and a human, and I don't tell the students which one they're talking to. You'd be surprised that like the failure of identification is like pretty high, even with a group of students that are able to ask any questions. Anyway, though, I have to finish what I'm saying here about the imitation game. Let's convert the imitation game into a test for, for whether computers have consciousness. Okay, so now how to do that. We're simply going to replace one of the human players with what do you think? With a computer, correct. So let's just take out the woman B. And now B is a computer. I'm trying my best to draw like a little something that looks like a computer. Okay, so <clears throat> now the game. Proceeds in a very similar way, except uh, the question that C has to try and determine is this. Not who's the man and who's the woman. But based on the answers he receives back during the interview, he has to determine what thing. What do you think? He's now going to try and find out by means of the answers he gets back, which is what? It's an, it's an identification game still. But obviously, can you guys tell me what is he trying to identify? Mr. C, the interrogator. I have no idea. You got to tell me. <clears throat> yes, that's right. He's trying to find out who's a computer and who's a human being. Right, correct. So when he's asking questions, he's not asking questions like, what's your favorite movie and seeing if it's a feminine answer or not. He's asking questions that he thinks will reveal which one is a human being, which one is like a computer that's answering questions. So if you were the interrogator and you're playing this imitation game Turing test to check for a consciousness of a machine, what kind of questions do you think you might ask? to see, is this a machine I'm talking to or a human? What kind of questions might you ask? Questions that you maybe think it would hard, be hard for a computer to answer like a human. So things like what? What's your favorite song, What's your favorite song maybe, right? Or like, what? tell me about some of your greatest fears or dreams. Have you been in love? Um, what? It, hmm? Emotional. emotional questions, things that you think a computer would kind of be stumped by because they don't have like an emotional life or like real life experiences, right? So anyway, he gets to answer or ask whatever questions that he wants for a set window of time. But once he's done with both interviews, he gets to make his determination. And again, what's a win now? A win is correct identification. So if he says, I can tell A is the human and B is the computer, then this computer did not pass the Turing test. But if he fails in his identification and he thinks that A is the computer and B is the human being, then that's one uh, loss for the interrogator and a win for the computer in the game. And what he thinks, Mr. Alan Turing thinks, is that if and when we reach a point in history where in these games the computer causes the interrogator to misidentify at about a 50% rate, then that will be the point where we should say these are thinking machines. Because at that time, he says, if you think about it, it will no longer be possible to tell the difference between when you're interacting with a real life human and a machine, even if you could ask any questions whatsoever in an interview setting. So that's why he thinks that this is the right test for whether machines have consciousness. And again, What's the criteria? When we reach a failure rate of identification of about a 50% rate of reliability. So it's not to say that if you get the wrong identification just once, boom, these are conscious machines. Because, you know, maybe the person was like um, drunk, half asleep, you know, one off failure of identification does not necessarily mean that the computer performed well enough overall to reliably generate the misidentification. So in like a series of trials, in modified different conditions, if we approach a 50% failure rate, then he says, 
it's indistinguishable now, whether that's a computer or a human that you're interacting with. And so now we should consider them to be thinking things. So that's his standard. Um, again, when will machines have consciousness? When we pass, when one of them passes the Turing test, or in other words, causes a human interrogator to misidentify which subject he's interacting with about half the time. Now, um, <clears throat> hopefully that makes sense. I tried my best to explain the game itself, but let's continue from there. He says, this is the right test for whether machines have consciousness because first of all, the way the test is set up, it eliminates certain things from being relevant. Like, okay, why is there a wall here? Well, because you can see otherwise that this is a computer and you can see that it's not like a human form. And um, making the test based entirely on the content of the answers received and not the visual appearance of the computer means that we're not going to discount it as thinking just because it looks like metallic or something, which he thinks that would be arbitrary. It doesn't really matter what its appearance is like. It's rather what's going on inside in terms of its like ability to pr provide uh, relevant answers to questions. So he says this test eliminates appearance as being a criteria. It also eliminates the tone of the computer's like synthetic voice from being a criteria. I mean, if you were talking to it and you could hear like a robotic tone coming back, that would give it away right away. And he thinks that's also not relevant to the core question of whether they have consciousness, because consciousness is not about the appearance of something nor about its tone of voice, but the quality of the answers that it could provide in response to questions. So he thinks the conditions of the game make those differences irrelevant, and he thinks that's good. So his next point in the, the, in the article is to try and give a more precise description of what kind of machines are being used in this game. Um, so I'll go through the different parameters of uh, core aspects of the digital computer as this you know, pioneer of the uh, device describes it in 1950. But before I go through those like basic facts about digital computers and what they are constructed like, uh, I just wanna make one mention because he says this at the top of what machines are used in the game. I think it's a kind of uh, curious comment, but uh, it's interesting. He says, the machines that are used in the game will be digital computers. And the one rule is that these machines that are used in the game cannot be a human brain that's born through uh, sexual reproduction. Now you might hear that and be like, what? Uh, of course, because we're trying to test whether machines have consciousness and a human brain is not a machine. But this is kind of an insight into the thinking of Mr. Turing. Turing does kind of see the human brain itself as like a naturally evolved biological computer. And so, you know, he's willing to use this awkward phraseology that use a machine of any kind as long as it's not a human brain machine. Okay, so once again, you can see for him the distinction between natural and man-made computing is kind of like very thin. It's There's just something that can compute information, whether it's you know, made out of transistors and chips, or whether it's made out of like neurons and synapses. But anyway, the, the machines will not be a human brain, they will be digital computers. So what is a digital computer? He says there's some basic similarities between the human computer and the digital computer. Once again, reminding us that he thinks of our brain as itself a kind of very sophisticated, powerful, but naturally created computer. And so he says, the digital computer is based on model of the human computer or brain. And he sees the human quote unquote computer as having three essential aspects. So let me put that here on the board. <clears throat> okay, so human computer, <laughs> basically brain, but as he puts it, the human computer, here are three major aspects of it. Number one, follows fixed rules. And he says, um, information and rules are supplied in a quote unquote book. This is a metaphor, but he uses that. And then three, uh, the quote-unquote book has infinite paper to do calculations. Okay, so let me go over these three points. Um, 
about the human computer brain, whatever you call it. First, he mentions that it does follow fixed rules. Okay, and so you might think, um, I don't know, is that really true? I mean, my brain, my mind, the things I do is just free. It's not necessarily governed by rules, but not really. I mean, it is. Everything that you do has some kind of rule-based structure. For me to talk to you right now, I'm obeying the rules of like English grammar and vocabulary to like produce sentences that you understand. If I'm writing something on the board, similar. I'm like writing them in accordance with the rules for inscriptions of meaningful content. Um, even walking just down the street or anywhere, you know, right foot in front of the left foot, left foot in front of the right foot in that particular pattern and order. And if it was just random and disordered, you know, you'd be doing nothing sensible or comprehensible. Um, riding a bike, typing something in a, you know, keyboard, um, playing a video game, playing an instrument, singing a song, um, writing an email, whatever it is, unless it just devolves into complete insanity and no one can interpret what you're doing, there's some kind of rule-based structure on it that could even be um, analyzed and provided to others as like the steps to go through in order to do that thing. So human behavior follows a sort of rational structure and that's why he thinks of it as rule bound. The second thing is this, the rules and information that we use to perform our behavior and conduct our actions is contained in what he calls a book. Now, that's a metaphor to say book because obviously it's not like there's an actual book in our body, but He's using the metaphor of book because think of the time 1950. If you're going to try and tell people in that time that we have like a storage basin of information within us, what metaphor would you employ? Well, in our day, we might say it's like a hard drive. You know, you've got a lot of files in there. But there was no such thing as that in 1950. So he would have referred to the thing that would have been a common example of, uh, and easy to understand for people. Books contain information. So your brain is kind of like a container of a whole bunch of rules, instructions, and information and facts, memories, whatever. So that's the book. And the third thing is that the so-called book of the brain or mind has like unlimited paper with which to write new information in. And that's, I guess, a distinction from a real book, which of course has a finite number of pages. But for you anyway, I guess think about it like this. When you learn new information, it's not like you have to clear files in the brain to create space for that. So you're like, I'm learning philosophy now. So I have to take out some of the history files that I had from high school to make room for that. No, you just have like this kind of ever open-ended file size for any kind of new incoming information. The only limitations on that would be, you know, the finite limits of your lifespan. And if you, I don't know, undergo some type of cognitive decay or disability through trauma or um, disease or something like that later in life. So, okay, three main functions or aspects rather of the human computer. And he says, this is quite parallel to three major parts of the digital computer, which he is a pioneer in creating. So here's the human computer and let's see how it's com comparable a little bit to what he calls the three main parts or elements of the digital computer. <clears throat> okay, so one of them is that uh, the digital computer has a, what he calls a store of info. So that kind of is like the modern day equivalent of like a hard drive of uh, storage that you can put a, whatever programs or applications or files into. Um, <clears throat> then there's an executive unit. That's like what we call today the CPU or whatever, the processing uh, unit of the machine or computer that carries out the instructions and rules that are contained in the store. And then there's also what's called a control unit, which makes sure that the rules and instructions are followed in a given order and not in like a randomized or haphazard order. So the, the fact that we've created digital computers that can parallel and take over some of the cognitive and computing functions of the mind, of the human brain, that allows us to um, outsource a lot of intellectual labor to these machines. I mean, whereas architects and engineers and stuff would have had to create detailed blueprints by hand in the past, now we can have computing systems take over a lot of that work and mathematical work and you know, computational work uh, that would take many, many human minds working in concert for a long time to do. Computers can shrink down the time scale of that by, again, taking over some of the intellectual labor for us. So um, they can mimic the actions of a human computer quite closely, and they're very useful for that reason. Now, digital computers are also what are called discrete state machines, and he mentions that. So let me explain that concept to you, too. <clears throat> So digital computers, computers, in other words, are discrete state machines.
And a discrete state machine, the word it refers to this. It's just a machine that is in one definite state at a given time. So never more than one, exactly one state at each time. With each new state a function, uh, a product of the prior state of the system plus an input signal. Okay, so a system that is in one definite state at a time. With each new state <clears throat> being a function of two things, being a function of the prior state, of the previous state, and an input signal. Okay, so that is a universal feature of all digital computers or all discrete state machines. Um, and the definition, as you see, is it's a system which is in one given state at a, a particular time with each state of the system being a function of its prior state and an input signal. So like as an example here, okay, like we're all walking around with little computers in our pockets nowadays, mobile phones, cell phones, okay? So right here is my Galaxy, um, what is it, S21 plus, whatever. And um, right now it's in its off stage, right? Like it's turned off. Now you can see the lock screen. So it's in the lock screen state at this particular time. Now, for it to display the lock screen state, we have to refer to the two things here. What was the prior state before that? Hmm? Off, right, and what was the input signal? With it off, I applied an input, which was what? To hit the power button, right, and so that shows the lock screen. Now, if we wanted to go a stage further, it's on the lock screen. Now, I'll swipe, and you'll see the home screen. So it's currently in that state. And once again, you follow me, like it's in this state because what? The prior state was lock screen and an input signal of swipe was given, unlocking this new state. And if I want to like open a web browser and I tap the button for that on the app, you see that I've got the web browser open. Why is it open now? Because the prior state was home screen and the input signal was touching the app button for Google Chrome. And if I wanted to do a, a, a search on Google, right? I'm search for the imitation game or the Turing test and I see results returned from my search. Now the current state is returning the results or displaying results from the search. But what was the prior state? Having the browser open, having the search bar filled, and then applying the input signal of hitting the return key. And that shows this current new state. So that's how computers work. They have to be given an input signal plus some kind of given state of the system. And according to its programming, it displays a new state. If you're playing video games or something and you're getting to the, the completion of a level or whatever, and it shows like congratulations after you beat the boss, then the reason that that state is displayed is because prior state was fighting the boss and the input signal was whatever manipulation of the controller device that you gave to the computing system to show this new, uh, this new discrete state. Okay, so um, the number of possible discrete states of the machine determines like how complex and how um, detailed the kind of software and programs that you can run on it are. And um, if you have two machines that are capable of displaying at least as many discrete states as each other, then they could imitate each other's behavior perfectly. Um, and sometimes we call these discrete state machines universal machines because this is the reason that we can port over any application to another computer which has a similar degree of processing power and can display at least as many discrete states as the other one can. So in a way this refines his question down just even a little more. The question then becomes, could a discrete state machine ever do well enough in the imitation game to cause reliable misidentification by the interrogator at about a 50% rate? And you want to know what Turing thought about that? He says, yes, it will happen. It's just a matter of time because computers, as he was writing this paper, were relatively primitive and unsophisticated. But he said, as time goes on, when we get around to year 2000, he's predicting 50 years ahead, he thought the machines would reach a point where they're able to deceive us maybe uh, 25 to 30% of the time, but that as computing machinery inevitably advances and becomes more uh, complex and powerful and fast, that it would only be a matter of time from there that we would get to that ultimate result of about 50% failure, and then we would be dealing with thinking and uh, conscious machines. 
But, but as you know, there's always objections in philosophy. So as, as, cle as clear and as clever as his argument may be, there's going to be people who don't think that this is uh, anything that shows that machines have consciousness. And he himself discusses some of those objections. So I'll try and talk to you about what a few of them were. Objections to his position. The machines would have consciousness or think if they could pass the Turing test standard. So what would be an objection to this? <clears throat> okay, so one of them he calls the mathematical objection. So here's objections to Turing's view that machines could have consciousness. One, the mathematical objection. <clears throat> Okay, so with this one, the, the idea is the following. For certain technical reasons, um, there are certain questions that a machine could never answer. And you might think that that's the difference between us, because for a human being, any question, no matter how weird it is, we could give some type of answer to it. But for certain formal mathematical reasons, there are certain questions that a given computing system would never be able to answer, that it would ever either say cannot compute, undefined, or it would just time out. So maybe that shows that unlike us, these are not really conscious beings. Okay, so for, for technical reasons, there are certain questions that the machine could never answer unlike us. So the, the machines, I guess I'll be more clear about that. The machines uh, could not um, have consciousness. Okay. But Turing <laughs> replies to this. So here's Mr. Turing's reply back. And it's a clever reply. He says, um, if you think about it, the human brain is also the same. It, we just don't often think about the questions that we cannot possibly answer. But there are questions that would utterly boggle your mind and that you could not give an answer to just like the computer. So he sees that there's really a parallel here between us and the computer if you really think about it. So um, the reply is we are, the, we are no different from the machines. Uh, there are also questions, there are also certain questions that a human brain can never answer. Okay, so for example now, um, why are there these certain questions that the machine could never answer? Okay, well there was this famous logician in the 20th century named Kurt Gödel, and he discovered what's known as uh, the incompleteness theorem, sometimes it's called the undecidability theorem, and this is actually quite important. It proves that um, inside of any formal system there are certain questions that you cannot answer from within the formal system itself. And so if you were to pose such a question to a computing system, you would not be able to give any kind of answer. Maybe this is not a perfect example of that, but here, just think of this. If you have a calculator and you simply take a whole positive number and you ask it to divide that by zero, it will not return an answer because it's an undefined mathematical operation. So it just says, cannot compute. Um, now you might think that that shows that these computers and machines are not similar to the human mind because when it's a human being, we have the creativity and complexity to formulate some type of answer even the strangest questions out there. Um, so does this mean that there's a difference and that shows that they're not conscious but we are? Not so fast, because now Turing says the following. In reply, he says, wait, there are also questions though that the human brain cannot possibly fathom any kind of answer to. So like, here, let me ask you this. What's the biggest number? Just tell me. What is it? You're maybe gonna think, oh, infinity. But <laughs> in set theory, we learned that you can take the cardinality of the whole set of natural numbers, which is infinity, and raise it to the next power, which gives you a larger size of infinity. And so there's really no answer to this question. It's utterly baffling. Or what if I asked you, does the universe have a beginning in time or does it not? And, you know, you really can't give me an answer either way because if you say it has a beginning, then it's coming from nothing, which violates all these conservation of energy and matter principles. But if you say it's been there forever, then it has no causal origin, which sort of violates the principle of sufficient reason. 
So we're boggled on that one too. And so you might think that um, there are some very far out questions that are right at the limits of human understanding, like where did God come from? Stuff like that if you believe in God. So there's questions that boggle the human mind too. And so he sees us as facing similar type of conceptual limitations as the computers do. Therefore, there's no difference to be mentioned really. So that's one objection and his response to it. Um, another one is kind of interesting that follows afterward. He calls it the objection from consciousness. <clears throat> so the objection from consciousness is interesting. What it says is, uh, the machines will never really be thinking or have consciousness because no matter how well they perform in the game, they're not really actually feeling anything inside. So um, no matter how well they perform in the game, even if they pass it with flying colors, they're not really actually thinking or feeling anything on the inside like we are. And therefore, that's not real consciousness. So what I write is that no matter how well the machines perform in the game, they're not really thinking or feeling anything inside, unlike us. So, you know, if I ask you a question, there's like a mental thought in your head as you think about the answer and you maybe go back in your memories. If I'm like, what did you do for your birthday last you know, year? You'll, you'll think of stuff and there's mental activity, like you have pictures and images in your mind and memories. If you ask a computer what did you do on your birthday last year, it might have a program that says, like, offer this output because of this syntactical input. But it's not like having those thoughts, feelings, memories, it's emotions or whatever. Well, here's his reply to this one. And it's, again, pretty interesting. He says, it's kind of like, how do you know? Like, how do you know that anything has consciousness except for you? Because, to be honest, whose consciousness can you verify from the first person perspective? Just your own. For all you know, everybody else is like a robot that just seems to have consciousness, but there's nothing going on inside of them. But, of course, you assume that other people have consciousness. Why? because of the behavior that they, that they display. Like, how do you judge that I'm a conscious being instead of an inanimate object? Because you can see the way I'm acting. So he says the only real test for consciousness is behavioral, because you can't observe consciousness from within except for yourself. And therefore, the same standard of judgment that any human has consciousness should be applied to the computer. And if it's behavioral, then if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck kind of thing, then it is. So anyway, um, the only way to determine whether anything has consciousness, except for yourself, of course, is to observe the behavior. And if that's not satisfying enough for you, you're like, well, behavior's not proof, though. It could be behavior, but it's not real consciousness. Then he says, that's too skeptical. That's like saying, well, I don't know if anybody has consciousness except for me. And come on, that's a little bit too much. That's like Descartes. So anyway, the only way to determine whether anything has consciousness is to observe its behavior. So it's a behavioral test of consciousness, not some kind of like being inside the being, feeling it have feelings and thoughts. Because if you're waiting for that, that's never gonna happen. Not just with respect to computers, but period, in general, with anything. And so there's a few more objections. Um, I think that I want to be complete and thorough with this because it's one of the topics and one of the authors that could be used for your philosophy of mind essay. But we've come almost all the way through it, so I think I can uh, wrap it up with about 10 or 15 minutes at the beginning on Friday. So instead of trying to rush through you know, the last two or so objections, let's do it that way. But um, I guess, therefore, we can kind of conclude a minute or so early. But let me know if everything's good, um, if that's fine for you guys in the chat, then we'll... Um, We'll close for now, and we'll pick it up next time. So if you have any questions, comments, or anything else, or if you're just good to go, let me know.
Personally, I don't know what I think about this question, whether machines could think at some point in the future, if I'm just talking about my own view. Um, I guess I don't think it's conceptually impossible, but it just seems, it also seems like it's a pretty far bridge to, to cross, you know, to build things that have thoughts like us. Could you explain the infinite paper of the human computer one more time? Okay, Alex. So a human being's brain has no kind of limitations in terms of the amount of new information that you can acquire. As I was trying to say before, if I ask you to learn a new language now, it's not like you forget the current language or that you, you just can no longer hold all those facts in mind. So a human being uh, can always learn something new. And it's kind of ever open-ended, the amount of new information that you can take in. So if you think about your mind as something that acquires information from the external world, like you watch a movie, now you know about it. You read a book, now you know about the book. You learn a new language, you learn like a new historical fact, you learn like a new trade or craft. You're just adding new information into this domain of existing knowledge. And all that he is saying is that that's indefinitely open-ended. And, you know, as long as you don't undergo like senility or some cognitive disability or decline, you can always add new information to your existing base of info. So you kind of have a hard drive, if you will, but with an infinite size, if that makes sense, Alex. So that's what I, that's what I was trying to say. But anyway, then, yes. To all those here, don't let me hang up on you without you saying goodbye, because I just think it's rude. So let me hear. Yeah, so I guess memories can fade, true enough. Um, and so you may be able to report that you don't necessarily agree with his, I guess, overly general way of putting it. But I think all he means to say is that there are certain differences between you and an actual computer. A computer certainly has a concrete limit of how much info space that it could take in. And at least we could say it's a little bit less clear what the conceptual upper bounds are of human uh, information and retention could be. But I take the point, and it's totally a fair point, Alex. But yes, I see that some of you guys have left without saying goodbye. This is not nice. Say goodbye, and then I'm, we'll close the stream. It's supposed to happen a certain way. <clears throat> Okay, thank you, Chase. No problem. Thank you so much, Alex. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one, and I'll be in touch with you guys. We'll, we'll meet up again on Friday. Okay, until then, see you. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Have a good one.